And I'm so excited to be here, and I'm excited that you are here, that you chose to join us to worship here at Discovery. So if you are new here, welcome to Discovery. I am Pastor Daniel. Um, I oversee our, I'm the director of our student ministry and our young adult ministries here. And so I'm excited to be sharing with you guys. Pastor Jason is actually um, at Northwest, and he's giving the message there, and he's, he's connecting over there. And so y'all, y'all stuck with me today. I'm sorry. I mean, I mean I'm a, I've, you know, I'm going I'm to do my best here. I'm just kidding. It's going to be a great word. We're in a great season called a uh, great series called Seasons, and so I'm super excited to, to share this message with you because I think it's so timely and it's so relevant to, to maybe even the season that um, you've been through or you're going through or maybe even a season that you will go through soon. So um, I'm excited to share, but before I share, man, I just want to give Man, I just want to give a shout out to our, our lead pastors, Pastor Jason and Veronica, man. They are amazing leaders. Come on, let's give it up. You know what? It's, it is a privilege for me to stand here um, and share the word and share this, this pulpit with our pastor. He's, he's an amazing leader. He's a visionary. He has so much drive and passion to see people's lives trans- transform and change, um, and, and he just... He just wants to launch people in their God-given callings and giftings, and, and it's amazing what God has done in, in, in our time here at Discovery. And so, um, man, Jason and Veronica, when you see them, um, give them a hug and say thank you because they give so much time and so much, so much prayer um, and, and effort into all they do, and they do it in excellence, okay? Um, but we're in, we're in week two of Seasons, and, um, and I'm excited to share. We've, this is kind of our theme verse um, for this, this um, series, and it's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. And it says this, it says, to everything there is a season. There is a season to everything. We know that, that God operates in season. God has a rhythm of the way he does things, right? Um, that's, that God is a God of order. So everything, there is a season. We have our summer season. I love summer. I, 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 love, I love swimming. I love to come out. I hate the winter. I'm sorry. I don't know why, but I think it's because I'm getting a little older um, and my bones, like when it's freezing, my bones start to like ache, you know? And so I'm like, oh, I don't like this. I don't want to go to the snow, you know? And, and so it's kind of like, I think that's just old age because before it was like, yeah, I'd, I'd go in the snow with, you know, I'd go polar bear, you know, diving or whatever um, when I was young. But, but there's a season. There's a season. But God operates in seasons, all right? Um, a time for everything a time for every purpose under heaven. There's a season and there's a purpose for every season as well. There's a purpose for every season that God has that he's kind of orchestrated and set into motion um, in the seasons, in the calendar seasons, in the rhythm of what he's done in our lives. There's seasons in our lives as well. And there's a purpose for every season. When I was, when I was younger, I've been doing youth ministry for a long time. I don't, I don't do it anymore as much. But when I was younger, I started doing it I was on the youth leadership team um, years ago. And in those days, like, I could actually, like, eat a bag of hot Cheetos. And um, I could sleep at about 1 in the morning and wake up at about 7 o'clock in the morning and do it all over again and go hang out with the guys and the kids and, and play football and then, you know, eat, eat some Little Caesars pizza because Little Caesars pizza is the pizza of youth ministry, okay? Because it's cheap. It's cheap right? It tastes like cardboard, but it's all good. Kids will eat anything, all right? They'll eat the cardboard. And so you want the Little Caesars pizza. But, but now, man, if I eat Little Caesars pizza, yeah, it's hurting the next day. I got like indigestion. I'm like, I'm popping the tums. I'm like, oh, like, what is this going on? And it's this funny stage. I wake up different now. I can't wrestle a student because they'll shame me. I'm just like, bro, like, how do you get so big? You know, like you're only 16. Um, and so it's just a different stage, it's a different season of my life, you know? And, and I think we all have seasons of, of life, and, and as it relates to what we're talking about today, there's a season that you're going through today. There's a season, and, we're, and so the title of this message, we talked about harvest um, last week. Today we're talking about famine, okay? Faith for the famine, because last week we talked about, you know, having and, and having a harvest. We talked about um, how to manage that harvest. We talked about, uh, Pastor Jason gave us some good, good points on, on timing and, 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 and how to steward the harvest. But what about when you don't have? 
I think it's, it's easy to be so passionate and on fire and in, in step with God when you do have, but what about those seasons that you don't have? What about those dry seasons? What about those seasons of, of drought? I don't know about you, but I've been through some seasons where it's just not enough. Maybe, maybe you're in here today and you're just like, man, that's, that's me. This message is already messing me up. You know, maybe, maybe you're in here today and it's, maybe it's, it's living day to day, week to week, month to month, and you're just trying to make it. And you're in this season where you just feel there's just this dryness happening. There's, there's just not enough in the month, right? It could be a financial hardship. It could be this season of, 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 of a job, maybe a job that you're at, and you're like, Lord, get me out of here. Get me away from these people. Or maybe it's, maybe it's a job that you're actually looking for, and nothing has come up. And you're like, okay, God, I need to do something because I'm going crazy. <laughs> I'm going crazy. Whatever season, maybe it's a season in your marriage where things are just not the same. It's a different stage, a different season. There's this dry season. There's this wilderness that you're going through. And whatever that is for you, you're facing a season of famine, a season of not enough. And sometimes what we do is we pray. And we pray and we're like, okay, we're going to pray, God. God, do this. God, God, move in this area. God, I'm praying that you would, just, you would just open the door, God. I'm praying, God, that you would send somebody to me right now. God, would, would you just move in some way? I don't know. You're God. You're supposed to do this. And, and, and we ask God to move and to move and to do something about, about what we're going through. And we pray for something to happen. We, we pray for God to back us up. God, come through. But listen, don't just pray to move the hand of God. Pray to remain in the hand of God. And that's what we're talking about today, praying to remain. Although this is going crazy, it's chaotic, it's dry, I don't understand the season that I'm going through right now, Lord, I'm going to pray to remain in you. I'm going to pray to remain in you and what you've given to me and where you have me. So the question isn't so much, where are you, God? The question is this, is how will I respond to the famine? How will I respond to the famine? There's four ways that you can respond to the famine. We're going to go through them. Number one is this. Sometimes we step in to fix it. Sometimes we step in when we're going through a drought, when we're going through some hardship, when we're going through these things, we just want to step in and say, okay, we need to fix the situation. And a lot of times we use our own intellect. We use our own uh, strategies our own philosophies, we'll think that we can ourselves fix the situation and we'll go and go and we're spinning our wheels and, and we end up finding ourselves in the same spot we started. And sometimes we even make it worse because we tried to take it and tried to fix something that God's saying, no, 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 that's where I need you right now. That's where I want you. We try to fix it. The second thing we do is this, we step back in discouragement not trying to fix it. We don't try to fix it at all. We just allow the drought to kind of just depress us. We isolate ourselves. We don't really talk to anybody about what we're going through. We just rather sit in our room and just, just, just cry and, and be depressed. And, and I don't know why I'm going through this. And we, and we step back in discouragement and despair. We step back in discouragement. Next one is this, is we step away from God's purpose. We're discouraged. We step in, we try to fix it, but sometimes we step away. And I, I, man, this is so unfortunate that some people step away from God because of our circumstance, because of, of the season that God has us in. We begin to doubt God. And we say, oh, we're, we're not going to go to church. We get frustrated. We get angry. We're not, we're not going to, I'm not going to pray because he should have did this for me because it shouldn't be like this. And we step away from our faith and we step away from the purpose that God has placed on our lives. We stepped away from his plan that he has. Number four is the right response. And it's this, we stay in step and in season. We stay in step with God and in season. Galatians 5.25 says this, it says, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. Since we live by the, step, by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. We don't, we don't shrink back. We don't go to the left or to the right. Okay. We don't try to fix it. No, we stay in step, in step with the spirit, in step 
with God in this season that we're in. This is so countercultural. This is so kind because of, nobody really thinks this way. I know the world doesn't think this way. And sometimes even us as believers, sometimes we don't think this way because we live in this culture and this age of, of disbelief and skepticism. And we have this mentality, our culture has this mentality of, I need to see it to believe it. Like, I, I, I need to see that so I can believe it. If it's not in front of me, if it's not happening, happening immediately, then is it true? Probably not. So we live in this, this culture of doubt and, and disbelief, and therefore when we're going through some hardships and we're going through some famines, we, we step directly in to try to fix it, or we curse God or, or whatever the case is, and, and we step away from what God is trying to do in our lives. I think even as, as believers, we sometimes have this faith in the harvest, and then in the famine, it's like, whoa, like this is not, this is not supposed to be happening. See, but something about faith is, That it's not faith if it fails when tested. It's not faith if it fails when tested. Because without a famine, without a drought, without a without a a wilderness, then how really is your faith validated? You You know what I'm saying? If if we are enough to make it happen, then what's what's the need of God being our source? Why why would we need God if we can do it on our own? And God is trying to do something in our season. Of drought, I I love Hebrews, the, the the definition of faith in Hebrews, chapter eleven, verse one, two. It says this: it says now faith is being sure, it's being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. We don't see it, but we're sure. We don't we don't see it, but we're certain that God is going to come through, and we're going to believe in faith. This is what it, that the ancients were commended for. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. I love Hebrews chapter 11 because it goes down this list. And the writer goes down this list and, and he talks about the men of God in the old days that were commended and acknowledged for their faith. And these guys went through a lot of the same things that we went through. Probably some of the things they went through were probably worse than what we would ever go through. Um, but they went through some drastic things and they made faith decisions along the way. And so when it's tough, we need to look to these ancients. And, and I love that the Bible does this because um, sometimes if you're a parent in here of, of kids, um, this is the greatest thing you can, you can say to your kids after you've told them to do something and they didn't listen. And then they come to you and, and they're like, this is what happened. And then I love saying, it's like, I told you so. <laughs> That's so satisfying, huh? It's like... <laughs> I told you that was going to happen. Why didn't you listen to me? <laughs> you know, like, you knew that was going to happen. I knew that was going to happen. I've been through it. I've done that. And I told you that was going to happen. You know, and then you do it again. You have to, I told you that was going to happen. And I, and I feel like in the Hebrews here, that's what, there's, that's what the, the writer is saying. Like, let's, let's look at these guys so they can tell us, hey, this is the lesson. This is what I'm telling you. You know, take heed. I told you this is the way, this is the way to, to have faith in the famine. And so... We're going to take a look, okay? We're going to take a look through, through Hebrews 11. We're going to take a look at these men of God that, that were, were um, faithful to God. Despite the drought, despite the famine, despite the things they were going through, they were faithful. They remained faithful to God. This is my goal today for, for us in this, in this message. Um, if you're in a season of struggle or famine or drought, maybe you've tried to step back. Maybe you've got discouraged. Maybe you've tried to step in and you've been just trying to fix something that God probably doesn't want you to fix. He wants you to remain. Or maybe you stepped away in anger or frustration and doubt or disbelief about where God has you and where he's taking you. This is my goal is is that the spirit of God would breathe on you (laughs) and that you would believe again. That you you would be inspired by the Holy Spirit to believe God at his word. So we're going to dive into this. If Abel here is, number one, is Abel was here, this is what Abel's lesson would be, put God first. Hebrews 11.4 says this, by faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. By faith, he offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke of his offering. Go to the next. Sorry. Do we have a next there? Genesis 4, 3. 
In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of, of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. There's something special about the first. There's something special about the first. A lot of people have a relationship with God. They come to church on Sundays. They serve. Um, I mean, you could be here, you know, five days a week serving. Um, you, could, you could have this relate. You've probably been a Christian for a long time, but, but this is interesting because he's, he's on the list. He's somewhere on the list, but he's just not first on the list sometimes. He's not the first on the list. And if he's not first on the list, then he's, he's not on the list at all. If he's not first on your list, he's not on the list of all. It's kind of like this. If he's not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. If he's not the Lord of all, if he's not first in your life, because God desires to be your first. He desires to be the first on your list. He, de- he desires to be the first thing you do in the morning. He's, he desires your first because there's something special about the first. Now, those of you who are married in here, uh, I'll, speak to the, I'll speak to the guys, okay, because I, I can do that. I'll speak to the guys here. Man, if, if you don't tell your wife first, <laughs> if she's the second one to know about anything, if she's the second one to know, man, you better go in that doghouse that you built for the dog and sleep in there. <laughs> I've done, I learned in my relationship, I, I did some things and I'm like, oh man, oh man. She's like, wait a minute, wait, what? and I'm like, oh man, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm like taking off, like, because, because first means something. It's, it's special. When you put somebody first, it communicates something special to that person. First will move the heart of God. If you put God first, it'll move his heart. God desires your first uh, attentions, your time, your finances, your, your, your everything that's in you. He desires to be first on the list. And even in your famine, he desires to be the first person you go to. Because sometimes we want to go to someone and we want to share something. And that's great. And I, I encourage you to do that. But go to God first before you go to anybody. Because God wants to know, man, this is, your sword. this is what you need right here. I, I want to be the first on your list. Can I be first on your list? God wants to be first in your life. Cain was a farmer, and he brought these, these fruits and vegetables in the course of time. He kind of brought it when it was convenient. Cain just brought this stuff, and he's like, okay, God, I'll give you this here. I'll, gi- I'll give you some time. I'll give you some of this here. But Abel, he was a shepherd, and he brought a different offering. But the offering wasn't important, and we all have stuff here. And that, that's not the importance. It's the order that's important. And before Abel ever knew that he would do anything, before Abel knew that he would be successful, before he knew he would have more flock, he gave the first to God. And God is just not interested in what you do, but he is interested in the order because priority matters to him. Priority matters to God. Why do we, why do we worship on Sundays? It's the first day of the week. We come the first day of the week. Uh, just for those of you who don't know, it's not Monday, okay? Monday's not the first day. Sunday's the first day. Um, we worship on the first day of the week, and we give God our worship on the first day of the week. Now, I'm not saying if you come to 8 o'clock, you're more holy, okay? That's, uh, I'm not I'm talking about that. I'm not talking about the order of the, our service times, okay? <laughs> um, but, but God desires our first. We're here on the first day, and we're giving him our first, okay? When we get up early in the morning to pray, it communicates something to God. He's first. He's special. Priority matters. matters. Until you decide to put Jesus first place, you'll never take that first step into your faith. You'll never take. You got to put him first. Enoch would say this to us. He would say, walk with God. Pretty simple. Walk with God. Step by step, all along the way, include God in your life. Hebrews 11.5 says, by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. It's amazing. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. If we go to the story in Genesis 5, 20, 24, Enoch walked with God. And then he was no more because God took him away. Imagine walking with God that closely where you're just in step with him. And then you just walk away. You don't even experience death. You just walk. You walk away with him. You're in step. You're that close to him. This word walk literally means this. It means that he was in step with God. 
Enoch was, was in step with God's will. He was in step with God's priority, with God's direction, with God's heart. He moved to the step and the heartbeat of God. He was in close fellowship with God. The Bible says he just walked, walked off with God. He was, he was that tight with God. He knew who his God was, and he was in step with God. You know how when you, when you hang out with somebody for a while, and you start talking like them, and you start, you start having the same mannerisms as, as them, and you start talking about the same things, and you're like, oh, and you say something at the same time, kind of your BFF, I guess, and you're like, oh, jinx, I was going to say that, and you say that, and you know them so, so well, you know? You start acting, you, you just know them. I know, I know for us, like, I've been married for going on 19 years now, and um, I, that's a long time, but God is good, amen. And so, so listen, like, like, my wife knows, like, she knows, like, I walk in there, I'm, I'm trying to get out the house, I'm like, honey, have you seen my keys? Yeah, they're on the counter. Oh, wow, all right, they're on the counter. Yeah, honey, have you seen my coat? Yeah, I put it in the jacket, you left it right there on the washer, I put it, like, she just knows what I'm, she knows my every step, it's kind of creepy, but it's not, because... <laughs> Because she knows me. We're that, we're that close. And you know what it is? This is, this is so crazy. You, you build confidence and trust when you know somebody that deep, when you're in fellowship with somebody that deep. Like, I, I trust she's gonna, she knows my steps. She, I know her step. And listen, when you have that close relationship, when you're walking in step with God, man, you know him. You know him. You know his character. You know his, his attributes. You know his heart. You know the way his, 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 his heart sways to. Like, you know God. This is the question here is, could it be that we walk away because we don't know God enough to trust where he's taking us? Could it be that we walk away because we just don't know God that well? So we don't really know what he has planned. We don't even know if he has anything planned because we don't know him. We don't walk with him step by step in the season that we're in. If you want to have faith in the famine, you have to walk in step. Noah would say this to us. His lesson would be act on God's word. Act on God's word. Hebrews eleven seven says, by faith, Noah, when warned about the things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family, Noah was ridiculed People laughed at Noah. You're building an ark. There's no rain. What are you doing, man? Why are you building a boat? There's nothing happening. People mocked him. People, people uh, scorned. People didn't believe what he believed, but Noah believed it, and Noah acted on it. And I believe we have nudges that God is, God is trying to nudge us in a direction to act on our faith. And, and we're kind of fearful, and we don't know if we should, and, and, and God wants to see us act act. Take a step. Don't apply your logic. Don't analyze everything. Don't, don't continue to wonder why, why, why. Even, even if it is irrational, even, just act in faith and act on his word. Because faith without action really is, is wishful thinking. It's, it's lofty thinking. Say, yeah, this is, but if there's no action in the faith, God is not a genie. God is just not going to, like God wants to, God wants to show himself through you. Amen. Did you know that? God wants to use your famine. He wants to use your, your, your drought. He wants to use your season to show that he's a good God in the harvest and in the, in the famine. Because he has a plan and a purpose. He wants the world to say, man, like that person's going through some stuff, they, but they persevered. Look at them. Like they're still joyful when it's tough. They're, st- they, 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 they're still serving God even though, like what's going on there? Like that's, that's not normal and and. and, and and you've been chosen in your season to display God's goodness and his glory in your season. Like God wants, you, he wants to commend you for the faith that you have in him. He wants you to be in Hebrews 11. He wants to be, you, you to be one of the ones that's, that's, that's noted as righteous because of your faith. He wants you to see so people can see the God that we serve. Some of you guys here have that nudging and it's, and it's time to act. And whatever that is, wherever, wherever God is saying, this is, this is where I want you to, this is how I want you to act. Maybe it's something simple as just pray. Just pray. Pray in faith. Just pray. Just get closer. Maybe it's just that. But whatever God is doing, he's wanting you to act. We came, I've been coming to Discovery for close five and a half years. And, 
And uh, we moved from Wasco. I know many of you probably don't even know where that's at. It's this small little town um, north of here. Um, but that's where we grew up. We grew up there. We had our church there. We had everything there. It was comfortable there. And God called us to discovery about five and a half years ago, and it was scary. I sold my house. We, we took our kids out of the schools there, man, and started, came over here, didn't really know to... But we knew God was nudging us because he had something great. And we've experienced famine and drought and, and seasons as in the time that we're here. But we never, we said, no, no, God has a purpose for us. We acted in faith. And see, you'll never know faith until you act on God's word, until you act on God's word. James 22 says, you see that his faith, his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did by what he did, his faith and his actions, him acting on what he did, his faith that kind of validated it, worked together and it completed what he did. Abraham would say this, number four, Abraham's lesson, lesson would be wait patiently. Oh man, I'm telling you, if you're ever in the drive through at Starbucks and you're like, I need caffeine, <laughs> you, ain't, you ain't waiting patiently. <laughs> you're not waiting patiently. You're probably honking. You're trying to yeah, we live in a culture that's so impatient because we're conditioned and, and, and we're used to, we're kind of just, we, we're used to everything at our fingertips, right? Quick, 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 this new Walmart thing where you could just, hey, I'm going to go order something and then go pick it up. They'll have it ready for me. Boom, it's done. I don't even got to shop anymore. They shop for me, I'll get it, you know? And so we live in this culture where it's just, it's instant, instant, instant. And this is opposite than our culture. It's like God saying, no, 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 just wait. Well, you want me to What? I don't want to wait, you know, just wait patiently, wait patiently. We can prolong this, this part of, of, of this, this sermon here. We can prolong seasons of drought and famine because of our impatience. They just go, go, go. God is saying, be patient, and we become impatient, impatient. Actually, there's this story of, some of you guys may or may not know, there's a story found in, in Genesis or in Exodus where Moses leads the people out of, out of Egypt and they go to the wilderness and they wandered for about 40 years in the wilderness because of their impatience. They couldn't wait on the Lord. They didn't trust them enough. They, they complained. They were imp- and they, they prolonged that, that season. It prolonged the promise of where God was taking them. Faith wouldn't be faith if it was always fast. If it was always immediate, it wouldn't be faith. It was it, it would be, I'm going to get what I want right now. But God says, wait patiently. God is more interested in your character than your comfort. He's, he's more interested in what he's doing in you in this waiting season. If you can believe this today, God is doing something in you and in your season right now. If you would just wait patiently for him because he wants to build your character. He wants to build your faith because he has something great planned for you. He has something great f- planned for you. Trust the process. If you're in here and you're going through a, a, a drought, you're going through, a, fam- you're going through a, a wilderness season, don't give up. Hang in there. Trust, trust God's process. I promise <laughs> it's better than what you would ever imagine, whatever you would think. Isaiah, this is not in your notes, but Isaiah 41, 30, 40, 31 says, but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. I love this one of my favorite verses because I've done a lot of waiting. (laughs) I've done a lot of waiting. And I have to remind myself, like, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Each day I'm waiting, God gives me new strength. Each day I'm in this season, God gives me new strength, new strength, new strength. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Hebrews 10, 37, 38 says, for in just a, a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. It's impossible to please God without faith. Number five is this. This is what Moses would say. Don't trust your feelings. Oh, man. Don't trust your, you get in your, you get in your feels sometimes, especially when you're going through a season. You know what happens a lot of times when you're going through a season is you start looking around. You start comparing your season to somebody else's season. You start comparing your life to somebody else's life. I've done this before. I've been in ministry. I'm like, 
Lord, why am I in this season? I give so much time. I give so much effort. I'm at the church all the time. Why am I? That person over there, they got that nice, nice house and that nice truck, and, and like they don't even go to church. They don't even care about you, God. Like, I love you, Jesus. And why? And we start getting all in our feelings, right? We start getting, we start getting all our emotions start to get the best of us, and we start comparing and look at, looking at other people and what we see, and we lose focus of where God has us. Hebrews eleven twenty four. this is Moses' story. It says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses is like, I don't, I don't want to be known as, as growing up there. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. By faith, though, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invincible. You would think in, in this, as they commended uh, Moses here, you would think that they'd probably talk about Moses splitting the Red Sea. That's faith right there. I mean, a whole sea splitting in half. Like, wouldn't you think like, man, that, put that in there. That's, that's faith right there. Or the Ten Commandments, come on, to go up there and get the Ten Commandments from God. Like, that's faith. Like, why wouldn't they put that? But, but they didn't put that. They put Moses chose to be identified by God rather than Pharaoh. He made a decision to say, I don't want that because I could have that. I grew up here. I could have that, but I'm going to have faith in God for where he's at me, and I'm going to suffer with my people because I trust God. I'm not going to go off on my, my feelings, what I see, what I've experienced. I'm going to go by faith, not my feelings. We live in this, this culture that, that preaches a different message. It's like, do what you feel. Do, 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 go where your heart leads you. If that's where your heart leads you, then you should go do that. And it's like, no, your heart's evil. <laughs> you don't have a good heart sometimes. I mean, if you think you do, man, like, hey, yeah, no, never mind, never mind, I'm going to go there. But li- listen, listen, we can't trust our feelings. We can't trust our hearts. Like, don't do that. The greatest enemy of your faith in the famine is your feelings. It's the greatest enemy when you're going through a drought, when you're going through a season of desert. Listen, you need some faithful people around you. You need some good mentors around you when you're going, because sometimes your feelings do get the best of you. Your emotions will get the best of you. You need some people that say, hey, man, like, or hey, girl, whatever. I just jumped into characters there. Um, But you're, you're, you're over emotional right now. Like, you're going off of your emotions. Like, get it, like, Get into God's word. Let's, let's talk about this, you know. You need some people around you that can say, man, you're going off of your feelings. Trust God where he has you. Trust him right now. Don't, don't, don't lead off of your feelings. Make a decision to stay with God and to, and to choose faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this. We live by faith and not by sight. We live by faith. We don't, we don't live by what we see. We don't compare, but we live by faith. You need some faithful people. We don't allow these things Uh, We see to persuade our feelings. We live by faith and God's word. We live by his word. Sixth thing here, we're almost almost wrapping it up. Joshua's lesson would be this. Thank God in advance. Thank God in advance. Hebrews 11.30 says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. Seven days. They already knew they already knew. They acted in faith. They said, we're going to thank God, and we're going to make our praise a priority right now because God is going to do something. We don't see it. We don't see the walls come down, but we're going to march. We're going to worship. We're going to praise through the storm because God is going to move, and we're going to thank him for it right now. And what would happen if we had this attitude of, of just thankfulness in the storm? Even before God, even anything happened, we just had this, this attitude of, I thank you, God, because you are going to do something. I don't have to know when. I don't have to understand, but I thank you because I know who you are. Thank God in advance. When you thank God after you received, after received it, that's, that's called gratitude. But when you thank God in advance, that's called faith. Philippians 4, 4 6 says this. says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, everything with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I think thanksgiving, it opens up 
a door in your relationship with God. I love, I, I don't, we don't get this too much, but I think this is the goal for all of us. I love when my kids thank me. It feels good, right? Like when, if you're a parent, you're like, yeah, I worked hard for that. You know, that, I, I worked hard to give you that. I worked hard to, to put this roof under your head. And when they, when they just come to you and be like, Dad, I just want to say I love you and thank you. I know this doesn't happen a lot, right? <laughs> if it happens for you, man, I need some pointers there, okay? <laughs> but, but it's such a good feeling when your kids are like, thank you, Dad. Thank you, Mom, for what you do. I, I appreciate Like, it, it doesn't happen often. But, but imagine, like, for us, like, do we treat God like that? Do we thank him in advance? Do we thank him at all? Imagine how that would move the heart of God if we thank them in advance. The seventh thing here, and this is the last point, final lesson, is this, is God always does the right thing at the right time. God always, despite our understanding of it, despite the circumstance, despite the drought, like God always does the right thing at the right time. I know this is hard because it's, we get in this mindset sometimes of like, God, but why? Why didn't you, why didn't you bring healing? God, why didn't, why, didn't, why didn't you open that door? God, why did you close that door? God, why am I, I feeling like this? No, God, God does the right thing at the right time. Amen. At the right time. Hebrews 11, 35, 38 says this, because these, these guys weren't the only ones. There were others. These guys were commended for the faith, but there were others who were tortured. They were refused to be released so they might gain an even better resurrection. And some faced jeers and flogged and, and even chains and imprisonment. They, they were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. I don't know, man. Sawed in two. This is, this is pretty, that's a season right there if you're being sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about it in sheep, about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted, mistreated, and the world was not worthy of them. The world was not worthy. They, they, they wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. Hebrews 11.39 goes on to say this, though. They were all commended, though, for their faith. Yet none of them received what was promised, would have been promised, but God had set, planned something better. Faith knows that God is planning something better than my plans. Faith... I, I believe faith this, does this. Faith looks into the lens of eternity, and it's, it's confident that God is in complete control of my season. And then it goes beyond just the temporary. It goes beyond than, than what we're going through. It looks into the lens and says, God, you're doing something in this season. God, I see you. God, I trust you in what's happening in my life right now. I believe that these men, they were commended for their faith, and they didn't see the promise. You know what I think happened was their, their focus and attention shifted from, from this promise to the God of the promise, God's character, God's goodness. They trusted in a God who would never leave them and never would forsake them. They saw, they saw beyond the promise. They saw a God that, that, that in his presence was enough for them, was enough for them. The beginning point of their faith was his character and his nature and they trusted. I believe if you're in a drought today, God is saying, trust me. If you're here today and you're, you're, you're in this drought, you're in this season of, of just wandering, you're in this season of what's, what's going on, God? Where, why am I here? Why is this happening to me? God is saying, trust me. Trust me in this season of famine. There's a story found in the book of Matthew. I want to read this. This is not in your notes either. It's found in Matthew 4.38. And it's a story of Jesus. He's in the boat. And the wind and the waves, and there's a, there's a storm, and the wind and the waves, that the boat's moving, and, and Jesus is actually asleep in the boat. And his disciples got up, and they were in fear. They said, they said Jesus, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care what's going to happen? I think that's, that's our cry in a, in a season of the family, like, God, don't you care? The same response, don't you care for me? Why? Check what Jesus says. He's, he got up and he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Boom. 
Wind and the waves were still. Then the wind and the waves died down, and it was completely calm. And then he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Why are you so worried? Why, do, you, do you still have no faith? Do you still have no faith? I believe that's what he's speaking to us today. In your storm and your drought, why are you worrying? Why are you so impatient? Why are you doubting? Do you, do you still have no faith that I am who I say I am? That I will meet you there. That I will give you the peace in the middle of your storm, in the middle of your drought. If you could just bow your heads with me this morning, God. We-